This episode of Untold Stories is underwritten by The Bruning Foundation and Citizens and Businesses of Captiva Island. beginning there were the mosquitoes mosquitoes so thick they blackened the screens blocked the sunlight and forced those brave souls who dared venture outside to cover their bare skin from neck to ankle i think some of it was style but i know there's a, a, two or three pictures of mrs carter and down to the ankles and down to the wrists it had to be horrible but it was miserable here the mosquitoes were horrible. I don't see how they survived, but they did. There was no electricity, no telephones, no cars, no air conditioning, no plumbing, and no land bridge linking the island of Captiva to the mainland. But life was good, and the people called it paradise. Today they have all those things, and much more, and some of the people fear their paradise is slipping away back into the mists of time. There's no character here anymore on Captiva. Not that I can see. The only character on Captiva is wealth. I mean, blatant, in your face wealth. Four barrier islands are strung along Florida's southwestern coast like a fragile, ever-changing string of pearls. Sanibel, Captiva, North Captiva, and Cayo Costa. The islands are essentially large sandbars that grew up off the main coast of Florida. And then vegetation came, and trees, and they expanded. And uh, our barrier islands have life cycles, and most of them have a common shape. You can see how their life cycles expand over the years, and the shape expands and contracts. And so that's how the Barrier Island started. Like most of Southwest Florida, the earliest known residents of Captiva were ancient people, the forebears of the fearsome Calusa, who later built a vast water-based empire and for centuries ruled the region from Tampa to the Florida Keys. By the middle of the 18th century, the Calusa were gone, wiped out by disease and the slave trade. But like the Calusa, the generation and cultures that followed them drew their sustenance and lifeblood from the bountiful seas and left their footprints in the alabaster sands. In fact, one of Captiva's most enduring legends relates how a harrowing tale of piracy gave the island its name, a tale that may or may not be true. I hear different stories. The most common story would be um, pirates leaving their, uh, bringing their women here, keeping them captive picking them up later, this is where they would store their women. That's the most common story I've heard of, how Captiva got its name. The popular myth, the legend, uh, for the name of Captiva is that Jose Gaspar, a pirate, uh, had kept, ha kept his captive women on Captiva Island, uh, hence the name Captiva. But unfortunately, it's not true. It's a great legend. We all love hearing the stories, and it makes for great tales on moonlit nights. But actually, Jose Gaspar did not exist. The reason for the name of Captiva has been debated by historians for many, many years. Maycomer has another alternate theory of Captiva's nomenclature, one that links the Calusa with the Spanish explorer who founded St. Augustine, America's oldest city. The story which has more credence than any other is that the Spanish under Pedro Menendez in 1566 
rescued a Spaniard who had been held captive by the Calusa for 17 years. And he was rescued on one of the barrier islands in southwest Florida. Now there are four barrier islands and the second largest at that time was Captiva Island. So we believe that Pedro Menendez called that island Captiva because that's where they rescued the Calusa captive. Fierce Indians, heroic rescues, marauding pirates. What other intriguing tidbits of history does this tiny island paradise have locked away in its book of secrets? Well, how about a Civil War naval battle? The Civil War history of our area is actually pretty rich. Uh, many people don't know about it. There were 17 naval actions along this coast. The southernmost land battle of the Civil War was fought at Fort Myers, Florida. And Captiva was part of all that because there were blockade runners operating out of the Clusahatchee River and the Peace River. And the Union Navy operated blockade ships along the coast. And at Boca Grande, they always kept one larger ship anchored to block that route of ingress and egress. And in March of 1863, Captiva Island became a battleground for a fight between some blockade runners and a blockading ship. The common thread that has tied the stages of Captiva's history together is the sea. In fact, it's said that the island's very first settler was a young Austrian sailor who was swept ashore on nearby Buck Key in 1888, lived off the land, and homesteaded 160 acres on Captiva. He eventually sold off much of his land to support himself. Today, a granite headstone marks his final resting place. There was a young sailor. His stone is over there. He was shipwrecked. It was rough. He was smart enough to take a lot of land that was available at the time. Captiva's history is chiseled on stones in the historic Captiva Cemetery, founded in 1901. Some of those stones bear mute testimony to the dues the settlers had to pay for their time in paradise. The early names are there, Carter, Brainerd, Binder, but most striking are the dates, headstone upon headstone, memorializing the tragically brief lives of infants. This is the little girl who owned the cemetery. And she stepped on a rusty nail. And at that time, no doctors, so she died. So many babies are here because there were no doctors. So that was rough. Rough, yes. But then nobody promised that life, even in paradise, would be easy. I always admire the early settlers, especially when I think about the mosquitoes on the island and when I hear how the mosquitoes would cover the doors and the windows and you would think that it was night when really it was in the middle of the day. When I first came here, you had to wear long sleeve, long sleeve sweatshirts in broad daylight. If you went anywhere near bushes, you were inundated with mosquitoes. And when I say in it, you would, in, you would inhale them. That's how thick they were. George and Elizabeth Carter were among the first settlers on Captiva. John and Elizabeth Dickey came from Bristol, Virginia, and built the first summer home in 1906. Growing up, their great-granddaughter heard many tales of life on old Captiva. Yes, life was tough. But for them, they thrived on it. They grew their own vegetables. They had access to all kinds of seafood. If you wanted to have clams, you just went out in your boat to where they had the clam bars and you just dug them up and you came back with a rowboat full of clams. If you wanted fish, you went out and you fished. Your staple goods, they would send a list by the mail boat. Someone would go and they would pick up, you know, the barrels of flour, the sugar, but everything else they lived off the land. Their first trip down was in uh, 1904 and it was more just kind of a, a trip to see what it was like here. So they um, met up with uh, Herbert Binder, who was the original homesteader over on Buck Key, 
my great grandfather really couldn't find any particular piece of land he liked over there. So uh, he said, well, let me take you over to Captiva, just right across the bay here and see if you find anything you like over there. And so they came over and they both fell in love with it. There was no road connecting Captiva and Sanibel to the mainland. Boats carried people, supplies, and the U.S. mail. This was the original ferry dock on Captiva Island. And the causeway and roadways out to Sanibel and Captiva weren't built until 1963. So prior to 63, all the goods and supplies that came to Captiva came by boat. And the supply boat would make stops here. All the folks would get all their goods and services, and if they wanted to go into town for business or whatever, they'd all come to this dock. And this was the original ferry dock. The automobile ferry went to Sanibel, and we had really the mail dock, the mail boat, and supply boat that came out here. They don't call these the barrier islands for nothing. Webster defines a barrier as a structure or object that impedes free movement. In this case, these fragile strands of earth impede the free movement of raging coastal hurricanes, sometimes shielding the mainland of southwest Florida from devastation. But the barrier islands could pay dearly for providing that shelter. In 1921, for example, Captiva lost a large chunk of landmass when a hurricane sliced across the island and opened a channel now called Redfish Pass. Prior to 1921, Captiva was 18 miles long, and after 1921, it was only nine miles long. And that's because there was a hurricane in 1921 that split Captiva Island in two. Thus, the island community of North Captiva was born out of a marriage of wind and fury. The hurricane of 1926 finished the job of opening Redfish Pass and ravaged Captiva's agricultural economy. Then, in 1944, yet another storm delivered the knockout punch, wiping out the last of the farms and plantations, recasting both the physical and economic landscapes. South Sea's plantation was sold and converted to a resort hotel complex. After really the hurricanes, the net impact was it moved into a more tourist-based economy, but that tradition was probably moving forward anyway. Even when South Sea's plantation was still a key land plantation, they subsidized their income by renting out the worker housing for fishermen. But Mother Nature wasn't finished. In 1960, Hurricane Donna again changed the landscape of the islands. And then came Charlie. Category 4 monster lashed Captiva in 2004 with 150 mile an hour winds, stripping the island bare of vegetation. It took out all of our electrical power in Captiva for over 30 days, almost over a month. This is in August of 2004, 95 degree temperatures, no air conditioning. Um, it destroyed the South Seas Island Resort. Um, it ripped every roof on Captiva Island, torrential rain seeping into all the buildings, no air conditioning. We had no running water on Captiva for two weeks. Hurricane Charlie was a major turning point on the island because it, changes, it changed the whole look of the island because before Hurricane Charlie, when you drove the Captiva road from the bridge to the first S-curve, it was like driving in a tunnel. The trees overlapped each other. It was hardly sunlight. It was rays of sunlight that would come through. The laid-back seclusion of a tropical island has traditionally drawn the rich and the famous, either thirsting for a quiet moment out of the spotlight or hoping to awaken the muse and prime their creative juices. Unbridged, undeveloped, and underpopulated, Captiva Island was a perfect fit. Charles and Anne Morrow Lindbergh sought frequent refuge here renting a house from Herman Dickey where they were sheltered by protective islanders from unwanted intrusion. Theodore Roosevelt, a fervent outdoorsman and conservationist, first visited Captiva in 1914, arriving on a floating fish camp which served the former president as a laboratory and living quarters. The houseboat was anchored in Roosevelt Channel, which bears his name today. Roosevelt returned to the island several times, visiting the old Snyder School. Robert Rauschenberg was already a highly acclaimed artist when he settled on Captiva in 1970, but as a patron of the arts, generous philanthropist, and passionate preservationist of the Captiva lifestyle, 
His contributions to his community transcended his eclectic genius. Bob Rauschenberg was a great guy. I'd see him at the local restaurants. He'd go out. He loved Captiva. He did a lot for Captiva. He, he owns a lot of property here. And he, they still, I think, is still undeveloped. He wanted to preserve as much of Captiva as he could. And uh, he, was, he was very good for all of Captiva. And uh, very, very, very nice guy. Just fun to be around. Bob Rauschenberg died on the island he loved in May of 2008 at the age of 82. But of all the celebrities who sought refuge or solace on Captiva, perhaps none had the long-term impact of an unassuming editorial cartoonist from Des Moines, Iowa. J. Norwood Ding Darling had already earned the first of his two Pulitzer Prizes when he came to Captiva in the mid-1930s, counting on the warmer climate to relieve a bad case of bronchitis. But the sequestered fish house he built on pilings over the waters of Pine Island Sound attests to the fact that Darling was a worker, not a vacationing snowbird. He had this house up on stilts over the water, and he had a drawbridge. He had a dock that came out to the house, and he had a drawbridge on it. Well, whenever he was working, he would lift that drawbridge so nobody could come. Now you gotta remember, back in those days, we didn't have phones on the island. So nobody was disturbing him because he had the drawbridge up. <laughs> and he would ignore anybody that came to it. Darling, a pioneer conservationist, was instrumental in blocking development on neighboring Sanibel and founding the National Wildlife Refuge that bears his name. Robert Rauschenberg later acquired the Darling property for use both as his home and studio and to protect it from development. Those of us who live or vacation here now are the beneficiaries of people like Robert Rauschenberg and people like Ding Darling who at a crucial time did the right thing and protected the island. If there was an abundance of mosquitoes on Old Captiva, there was also an abundance of fish for those who harvested the bounty of the sea. In 1879, George Brown Good of the Smithsonian Institute surveyed Southwest Florida's fish camps and found one of the most successful on Captiva Island. He documented that the guy running the fish camp there, who was very successful, was Captain Pierce of Key West. And Captain Pierce employed 30 men named Cox because they were born and raised in Key West. They were so successful that in that year that Good did his survey, Captain Pierce and his conch crew got 660,000 pounds of mullet and 49,000 pounds of mullet roe. They would take them down to Havana and also Matanzas in Cuba and they sold the fish into the, Span the Cuban Spanish market down there and they would get four cents a pound for the actual mullet, and they would get five cents a pound for the mullet row. That adds up to a lot of money in 1879. Fortunes were made at Captiva Island from mullet and fish eggs. Southwest Florida may well have taken its first step toward today's tourism-based economy in the late 1800s when a lucky angler landed the first tarpon somewhere off the barrier islands. We had a barter economy down here among the islands and the barter economy transformed into a cash economy when tarpon fishing started. And when the northern tourists, primarily from New York City, came down by train, they brought money with them and they paid for guide boats and tackle and bait and guides and they brought money. And so that was an infusion of cash into an area that for many years was on a barter economy and self-sustaining. Around 1940, a transplanted English fishing guide named Andy Rossi purchased the Captiva ferry dock with financial backing from one of his best clients, Ding Darling. Charismatic and popular, Rossi had the store on the property moved and opened a bar called Andy's that became a hub of the Captiva community. The bar is closed, but the general store still stands nearby, the only one on the island. The early history of the Barrier Islands was written by black hands as well as white, 
and the little-known contributions of African Americans and other early settlers are being chronicled and preserved in print and in photographs. One of the things that we're doing is concentrating on making sure that some of those stories do not get lost or that we can resurrect some of those stories in the early black settler families and their contributions to this part of Southwest Florida. I was born not too far from here on Captiva, not too far from the fire station off of Dickey Lane. My parental grandparents came here in 1917, was Isaiah and Hannah Gavin. They came here to do farming. And my maternal grandparents came to Sanibel in 1923. The contributions of the early black settlers are really varied. When they originally came here, they were sharecroppers, so they were, of course, you know, doing a lot of the truck farming and things like that. But as the environment changed, as the land changed, they actually went into other areas, such as the service industry, working at the resort, construction, landscaping, plumbing. Minorities accounted for only a tiny percentage of the island's population in those early days, and race does not appear to have been much of an issue, at least not for the children. Race relations was not a problem because you were not taught the problem. We didn't know about the problem, so we played together occasionally, did things together. And probably the only time that we would really have a problem would be mostly during season when people would come from elsewhere and bring their troubles to town. Other than that, we got along fine. Through the years, Captiva was largely a winter retreat for refugees seeking escape from the bitter cold up north. Yes, it was, as it was when my great-grandparents came here. I mean, they spent six months here, so, and they had teenage sons, so they brought a tutor with them when they came, um, and then they would go back. And a lot of people were like that. They didn't stay in the summer because the mosquitoes and the no just would drive you crazy. You couldn't stay here. The passage of time inevitably brings change, and so it is with the Isle of Captiva. Therein lies a paradox. As more people were drawn to the seductive tropical charm, the very character of the island that drew them in the first place began to change. Is paradise being lost? Captiva has changed tremendously uh, since the days that I grew up in these islands. It's very crowded now, and the demographics have changed completely. But there are still some places that remind me of the old days. In some respects, I think it has been lost. But then like here at Jensen's, they have their bit of paradise still here. Next door is Andy Rossi's old property, which there was a bar out on the dock that people used to go out on Saturday night and pick before there was a bridge out here. And our little place here has been here since the 40s. We've just kept this place going. This is what it was like in the 40s. To some extent, the changes on Captiva divided islanders. The focal point was the size and the style of homes being built on their paradise. I don't like them because they are not, they are not indicative of what should be here. They don't fit in these surroundings. They're beautiful homes, but they don't fit the environment here. Now, I'm not as thrilled. It's too commercial and uh, too many big houses. It's lost its charm. What does the future hold for this fragile island paradise? Can it withstand the winds of change just as it has survived the wrath of hurricanes? It's changed very much, much too uh, modernized now. The old island life is gone pretty much. I think Captiva has always been dramatically changed with the people coming in and buying. Captiva was always small homes, tropical beach homes. 10, 15 years ago, people came in, tore these homes down, put up the big homes, 
which has really changed, Captiva. The island would probably sink with all the concrete. That's what I think. With the amount of building now, I mean, it's going to be wall-to-wall -wall mini mansions. Times have changed. One thing that you can be certain of is that you'll always have change. Um, so things will always be different, but I think Captiva will always be special. So, after all is said and done, what is really paradise? Pristine sands, modest cottages and gentle living, unencumbered by modern amenities like electricity, cell phones, air conditioning or computers? Or is paradise opulent mansions, multifamily condos, high-speed telecommunications, concrete highways, pricey boutiques, high-end bistros, and extravagant lifestyles? Perhaps, after all is said and done, Paradise is really a kaleidoscope, a collage of colors and patterns that can only be found, ultimately, in the eye of the beholder. I moved on the island in 1958, and I loved it. I loved it. When I came across that ferry and I saw this island, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. To purchase a copy of this and other WGCU-produced programs, go to WGCU.org or call 1-888-824-0030. This program was produced for the citizens of Southwest Florida by WGCU Public Media. Show your appreciation for programs like these. Become a member of WGCU, a business supporter, or leave a legacy through a state or planned gift. Call or visit our website at WGCU.org.